Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Ableton Music Producer Podcast. This is Dan Giffen. Today's special guest is Stolen Drums. It's a really good episode. He is a chill hop producer and educator. He's been featured on Splice with his sample packs. He's performed in a lot of major music festivals and music venues. He also was featured in Spotify's Lo-Fi Hip Hop playlist. But today we talk about his process creating sample packs specifically and what that looks like. We talk about his beat making workflow, his creative process and how he stays inspired as a producer. We also talk about how he quit his nine to five day job, making really good money as a contractor for Google to become a successful producer and doing that full time. Time. There's a lot of good stuff in today's episode, but before we get started, wanted to let you know that if you haven't joined the Discord yet, then go to liveproducersonline.com slash Discord. I'm posting new stuff that I'm learning all the time, and other people can share tips and tricks producing in Ableton. Uh, we have a lot of different channels set up in there to help you learn and grow and connect with me and other producers. So check that out, liveproducersonline.com slash Discord. If you want to join the newsletter, be the first to know when new episodes come out, go to liveproducersonline.com slash newsletter. And every Tuesday, I am releasing a new podcast episode, so you can stay tuned for more then. Also, if you haven't upgraded to Live 11, I would love to hook you up with a discount. Saving money is great, so just go to liveproducersonline.com slash buy Ableton, and I will hook you up. Before we jump into today's podcast, I want to give a huge shout out to our sponsors, which we love. If you're in the market for buying a new audio interface, definitely check out Audient. They have become a key player within the recording world, boosting a competitive range of studio essentials. They have recently released their new generation of the popular ID audio interfaces, the ID4 and the ID14 MK2. They have really great Audient console mic preamps, pristine converters and offer incredible audio performance in a solid compact little box. So check them out. Definitely go to audience.com slash AMP podcast. That's audience, A-U-D-I-E-N-T dot com slash AMP podcast. And it's definitely worth looking up. If you haven't heard for the millionth time about Melodics, you guys definitely should check them out. If you haven't joined, there's a free trial. It's a fun desktop app that you can download and gamify your practicing. It's a great way to step up your skills practicing in the studio with a MIDI controller. Maybe you want to step up your scales or music theory, finger drumming. Or if you're a drummer, then plug in your electric drum kit and check out their large lesson variety where you can grow your skills producing and practicing and while having fun doing it, because music should be fun. So definitely check that out. Go to Melodics.com. You can save 20% off of their subscription, which gives you access to a ton of more lessons and options. So go to Melodics.com, sign up for the subscription, save 20% with the discount code LPO-20. That's LPO-20 and save that money. So thanks to Melodics and Audient for sponsoring this episode. And without wasting any more time, let's jump into today's podcast. Yeah, well, uh, thanks for joining the podcast, man. For everybody listening, uh, Chris Wilkes, also known as Stolen Drums, is a chill hop producer, a sample library curator, educator, a rapper. He's performed some major music festivals and venues, uh, including the Mercedes-Benz Stadium in Atlanta. It's pretty dope. Uh, he's played with some world famous uh, people and and has also done some other cool shows like in LA, Low End Theory, Venue, Beat Cinema. Uh, he was also on the cover of Spotify's Lo Fi Hip Hop playlist. You could probably keep going on about your creds, but uh, yeah, man, long story short, thank you for joining the podcast. It's good. No, nah, man, I, I appreciate you having me, man. It's, a, it's always an honor to like hang out and do stuff with Ableton because I'm a big fan. So yeah, here I am. Ableton Gang Gang, dude. That's what we do. Exactly. Right. So, so, yeah. Well, I mean, for people who maybe don't know you yet, can you share just a little bit of a brief history of how you got into producing music and maybe how that led you into Ableton? I actually was listening to uh, a podcast that you did not too long ago, and you said that you had no intention of having a music career. And now here you are. Yeah. Um, just made beats for like stress relief, essentially. Um, and I would send them to my friends. And I sent a lot and, you know, after a while they were like, Hey man, love your music, but, uh, I don't have any more space on my phone. So you should relax. And then I had to find another way to send music to people. So I, I started doing live streams and that kind of turned into a music career, which is awesome. And I wouldn't trade it for anything. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that was a long story short. That's <laughs> right. Right. That's awesome though. I mean, like in the world of, that we live in today, seems like live streaming has been everything the last 12 months or so. Right. 
and you've already got that on lock. So I've been watching some of your live streams that you've been doing. Uh, are you still doing that controllerize every Monday? Monday. Yeah. We're working on it, man. Uh, COVID obviously kind of killed it. We, um, so controllerize producer collective here in Atlanta, Georgia. We, um, we started doing shows about three years ago and very quickly went from just like a bunch of beat nerds playing music from each other to like, uh, a weekly festival type of environment where there was like fashion and food and anime and a theater for that and arcade and you know different dance crews from all over the place would come in um so it went from like 100 people to like 800 people and then we toured the planet and ran around the world music is crazy it will like do way bigger things than you will ever dream of it doing um but yeah so covid hits right after our biggest show we're like 850 deep like oh my god this summer's gonna be crazy and then covid hits and then everything stops and then, you know a year later we're we're still planning and trying to figure out how to bring it back but i think i think before 2022 uh we'll be back before 2020 like 2022 that's really difficult to say but yeah we'll be back soon it's getting pretty close it is, man. Um, shit, hopefully, you know, within a couple months, we'll be back. But I don't want to jinx it, so, you know. The time's right. It'll happen. Exactly. Exactly. That's how I feel about a lot of things. Yeah, that's cool. Well, So you just started doing some live streams, and then uh, how did you stumble into Ableton Live? Man, so uh, I, I, this is the probably one of the first machines I started with, this uh, MPC 2000 XL. And it's still here, still on my desk. I still use it on a very regular basis. Uh, I love the way it sounds. It's a big part of me, for sure. Um, and when I started touring and moving around, I took it to a few places. And, you know, it's kind of hard to travel with this guy. And you get a little nervous about it. You don't want it to break. And there's just all that stuff involved. Yeah. And um, I started seeing guys play live sets. Like, I would DJ, two turntables, Serato. And I would see these guys pull up with launch pads. And they would do crazy stuff like oh, i'm gonna drop this part bring this other part in and fade in pieces and i was like hey what are you doing like why is it why is that possible that you can like take your drums and make three or four different beats out of something in real time like i don't even understand how this is happening and it was like ableton bro you gotta get on it and then i was like whatever that, like, whatever that is and then uh it just kind of progressed and progressed and my peers kind of started doing the same thing and a lot of people i really looked up kind of started doing the same looked up to started doing the same thing and i just finally bit the bullet and it was like i have to jump on board so i started with just like a keyboard like literally like a apple keyboard and i figured out the program and yeah. um i actually bought a push before that and then sent it back because i didn't understand the program like it it kind of broke my brain yeah that happened uh, a lot of students i've taught over the years same thing they buy the push and they don't know how to use the software I find it's a lot easier to learn the software first and then push just kind of connects into that. Absolutely. Yeah. It's super second nature. Once you understand what's happening, you know? Um, but yeah, that, you know, that was my kind of, that was kind of like how I fell into it. Once I saw everybody else rocking it and then I understood how it worked with the keyboard, it was like, Oh yeah, this is dope. I could do whatever in here. Like literally whatever, whatever you can think of you can get done. So yeah. from that point on, it was like, yeah, I rock Ableton a lot. It's a big, big part of what I do. Yeah. Yeah. Same, man. Changed my life in a lot of ways, to say the least. I mean, you've worked with a lot of different artists. You've released a ton of music. I have to say, as a vegetarian, I love the name of your past three albums, Veggie Tacos, one, two, and three. Yeah, man. Are you a vegetarian? I'm a vegan at this point. I'm actually leaning toward like you. raw vegan, but I'm not there yet. I was like, it's a level of discipline that I just don't quite have. <laughs> time i think to be vegan because it takes it takes time to cook all that from scratch unless you're eating out all the time right right and then it's just like you know this kind of like the more i read the more i learn the more i kind of study food or whatever the less confidence i have in like you know the factory farming and the way meat is processed and you know just that whole system is kind of jacked up in a lot of different ways so it's not only bad for your like internal but like industry everything you know what i'm saying so i just kind of stay with the veggies you ever watched the documentary super size me part two called holy chicken i didn't but i saw the first one and that was that was that was enough oh dude it's <laughs> wild. you should do it. yeah I mean, the second one's crazy the guy starts a chicken farm basically yeah. just encouraged me to be more of a vegetarian 
real. It was wild. Like the, the stuff that people can get away with having chicken farms and then calling it organic is or free range. It's like complete bullshit in a lot of ways. It is. It yeah. is, man. And then it's just terrifying in general. Like it's like they're animals. Are you yo, all right. So I'm an anime freak. I, I love anime. Yeah, yeah. I love that. All right. So I watched Attack on Titan and I'm watching Attack on Titan and there's a scene where they're like, we don't understand. We don't understand why they eat people. They don't have to. They don't even have digestive systems that can break down people. They just throw them up. They just eat people like just cause I don't understand why they're doing it. And then you see like the Titans running around all crazy looking and shit and they're just eating people. And I like, I had like an existential crisis and shit. I was like, yo, we're fucking, we're Titans, bro. Like (laughs) that's us in the world. I think a lot of it really has to come down with like the source where the meat is coming from too. You know, like if you have a happy pig farm where the pigs are running free and having a good life fed like natural food and like, you know, green free, whatever that I think makes a difference as well for people who choose to eat the meat thing. But for me, I just find for inflammation, I have a lot of inflammation issues Mm. for me being vegetarian plant-based really helps. That's fair. That's fair. I I feel like I can't get around. Like the animals have to, you know, you got to murder them to eat them. Like they have to no longer live to get on your plate. And it's like, and then if you don't have to eat them, it's like, why what are we doing that for? It's kind of, that's a lot, bro. Like I don't, I can't really wrap my head around that. This wasn't the Ableton Music Producer podcast. I'd say we could probably just talk about animal rights for the next hour. I'm- <laughs> <laughs> Easily, I'm into it. Uh, Easily, on the same page too with that. But um, yeah, I mean, going back to music, like who are some favorite artists that you've collabed with over the years? Like, what did that look like? Oh, man, most of the collaborations I have were just people who were like, "Hey, um, send me some beats." So most of that stuff is that. Uh, and it's all been really dope. Uh, the Mick Jenkins thing was really dope. I like what he did. There was a Griselda thing that happened not too long ago. That was cool. I like what they did. I just did the collaboration with Earth Gang. I don't know if that's going to make the album or not, but that was that was, that was super fun. It was like the first collaboration collaboration. Okay. Um, but that was really dope because I'm a big fan of like them, even outside of music. I like the community stuff they're up to. They have, I like the label that they're on, all that stuff. They have great personalities. They seem like yeah. to hang out with. Yeah, it was fun. It was like a good time. It was really dope. I was just probably one of the better experiences I had in the studio. Uh, I did some stuff with Maxo that was really fun because he's just a dope dude. Um, Iman Omari, that's like my bro. Like we we don't have a lot of release music out. We did some stuff. I think we got like one song out or something, but we work together all the time. And he's just like a friend. He's just super like he's Iman. That's my bro. Uh, so that's probably one of my more favorite people to hang out with and work with. Uh, DBIC is my OG. He's amazing to work with. Yeah, man. I haven't really had too many bad experiences in the studio. I feel like all collabs are kind of fun. For real, for real. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I'm sure you're pretty picky with the people you do collab with, and I'm sure that makes a big difference. Yeah. To an extent, I, I'm I'm open. Like, I, I want to experiment, and I want to, like, get out of my comfort zone. So, like, it's good to do that. Even, like, artists that you're not, that you're not super hip to, if you like what they do, you like what they do. So, like, you know, just have fun with that shit. I don't, I try not to take it too serious. Yeah. Yeah. I feel that for me, music should be fun. It should be a journey and experience. Just ride that wave. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, I know that you do a lot of sampling with uh, like the whole chill hop lo-fi genre you've really like come up in, especially uh, like what does your sampling process look like? I know you got a turntable chilling over there. You got your push to, you got the NPC you mentioned. Like maybe we could just nerd out a little bit. I know in your Spotify profile, I think it's kind of funny. Your Spotify about says you're a nerdy dude who never leaves the house and watches too much anime. That's yeah, that's super accurate. I don't know why I wrote that. That shit is I read good. That. Bullseye is what that is. I read that and I was like, I can relate to this guy. So what <laughs> like <laughs> uh, but, uh sampling, I I'll sample anything. It doesn't matter. Uh, there's an SP in here too, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I don't. Four hundred four. Like, yeah, the OG, the four hundred four. I painted it with like some crazy spray paint or whatever. But yeah, it doesn't. You know, I'll sample anything at any time. I love records. I'm a big fan. I like that texture and that 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 kind of like that aesthetic, if you will, sonically. But I don't do that. I'll sample YouTube or video games or like old school '80s cartoons and commercials, whatever. If it sounds dope, I'll chop it up. I've been. It's interesting, like Ableton, because I was legit 100% sampling on this guy. Like, that was it. 
sample, drums, two track, nothing else. Like there's no processing. I'm not mixing. There's nothing. It's just literally drums, sample, and I would just squish it in a 404, you know, vinyl sim compression, call it good. Um, and just to kind of reiterate, like you're doing all of the samples and everything that came built in the brain of the MPC, and then you mm -hmm. just process the effects into the 404. Right, right. Yeah. So I would come like, it would literally be the stereo outs of my MPC into uh, stereo ends. I had a 303 on my desk for a while, at least at that time. Uh, and then I would do the vinyl sim compression on a 303. And then a 404, I would just like record everything to a pad with stutters and delays or whatever else I was doing. Nice. Um, and I love that sound, man. I, I still produce like that sometimes. Like, it's dope. I, I really love it. That's the Veggie Tacos sound. You know what I mean? So if I did a four, it's going to have that. But once I got into like working in Ableton and being able to like mix, then it was like, oh, oh shit, I can like, I can change the tonality of this sound. I can cut out a space for it. I can make it move around. I can do crazy stuff. So then that, that's kind of opened up a whole nother can of stuff to dive into. So like in Ableton, the sampling workflow is similar, but different in the where I'm manipulating things more. So I may like, you know, throw a filter on something, but then put an LFO on that filter so it has a bounce to it. But then I can change the phase on that LFO so it sits in a certain pocket. You know what I mean? And that becomes not necessarily like the driving force of the record, but an element now. And where on my NPC it would have been the whole record. It's just that. It's just the element now. And now I'm, I'm open arcade and throw something else in there that kind of works with that. And I'm be between EQ filtering and panning and all of that. I can find space for them both to sit and complement each other. Yeah. Make a couple buses some other crazy stuff you know what i mean yeah so yeah. like it became more of like painting with like watercolors to like painting with like a computer <laughs> like you know uh like watercolors like it's it's like easter egg watercolors it's just all these like colorful little clips sprinkled everywhere yeah i mean ableton feels to me more like uh i guess in in that sense like looking at you know what i'm saying the view yeah for sure but like working in it feels more like it's like I have every tool in the world at my disposal. Yeah. Like, if you can imagine it, you can achieve it type of thing. That's almost intimidating sometimes. You have to, like, level set. Like, all right, what do I want to do? You know? You know, analysis, paralysis type of vibes that happens. But you also can, like, you can do anything. So you can go, oh, I want to take this and cut the bottom off and filter it and make it a twinkle. <laughs> you can't. You know, I want that twinkle to move around like this. I, yeah, you can do anything, you know. Um, you can automate the geese and have them do shit like <laughs> I've said this multiple times on the podcast by now. Everybody knows in the world that Dan has a geese problem at this point. It's like, right. I, I, I promise, guys, after saying this so much, I'm just going to give away a goose sample pack in the next coming months. What's the web? Goose. Yeah. <laughs> Different kinds of honks. You can transpose it with a macro control. I'll make it cool. real and easy for you yeah, yeah man i'm gonna go crazy um so when you do lay down a beat say on your npc maybe maybe you don't run it through the 404 or your 303 and then you do you start ideas in session view and and then move to the push is that kind of like a workflow or is it change i'm almost primarily in clip view and i perform the thing and that be like the only time i'm hopping over to session view is like i perform the thing and then I hop over and like arrange, you know, and arrange everything like I want to arrange and do whatever. I, I hop over there and do what I need to do to make it right, you know? So it's like, okay, I did this filter sweep here and it was kind of sloppy. Let me go back and clean automation up. Um, or like when I transitioned from here to here, instead of a four bar loop, it was eight. I don't like that second four bars. Let me get rid of that. I'll do all that type of stuff over there in arrangement view, but 98% in clip view for sure. Yeah. And session view, so you're like working top to bottom at the scenes kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right on. And I may make like 10 different ideas in one setting, you know? Yeah. Um, and then I'll I'll just play with that session for a while. Like, okay, you know, do I want to add stuff to this one? Eh, I like that. Or maybe I want to mix this with that and that with this. And, you know, you end up just kind of, you may make 20 beats in one session and then end up with one. That's like the one, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And that makes sense too with your workflow because... With the push, I mean, it's really designed to shine inside of session view versus arrangement, you know, mm -hmm. has its own little session button and stuff. 
So as far as people like out there who are making beats, it feels like there's a billion ways to make beats out there. I know people who are making tracks on their iPhones right now. You know, I mean, it's it's there's a whole world of possibilities. Absolutely. For people who want to say start releasing their beats and start maybe monetizing the work that they're doing, what are some tips or maybe some personal experiences you've had over the years? to be able to monetize some of your music and releasing beats or what, what does that look like? for you? I would say like, it's interesting because like the things that we did early on, I'm not even sure if they work anymore. Right. Um, my entire career is based on community from like the shows that we do from the live stream itself to the music I'm producing. It all revolves around community. Pretty much everything I'm doing is, you know, in the back of my head, it's like, does this benefit the community? Right. So I'm taking calls like this one, for instance, I'm like, oh, this would be dope. I think this is good for culture. Like we should do this. We should have this conversation. This is cool. You know, or like if I'm working with a company or anything, it's all kind of based on that. So I say that to say, like, if you're a new artist that's starting, I would start working on your community, find people like minded, uh, either in your space, like physically, geographically or whatever and start hanging out and make music together or like find people who enjoy what you do, but just, you know, find a way to be a good part of your community, if you will. Yeah. And like the opportunities will start coming based on that. Because like, if I say, Hey, start live streaming, bro. Like I, I can't guarantee that's going to work for you. Cause that may not be the thing that works. And I'm like 40, you know, the stuff that's tight to me, isn't going to be tight to somebody who's 19. You know, I'm like, yeah, I still live stream on Facebook. YouTube and Twitch on a regular basis. And like my, I got a kid, he's 19. He doesn't do any of that. He's like, yeah, I'm on TikTok, you know, or whatever other app he's using because he's 19. So like, you know, I don't even know what gains traction, but I don't, I don't care about any of that. I just care about the people that care about what we do. Like it's about beat culture. It's about community. It's about the best part of that. I can't, you know what I mean? So like, how can I look out for other producers? How can I look out for people that enjoy the music that I make? How can I look out for folks that like want to get into the space? That's pretty much my drivers. No, and that really shows even with the uh, Instagram videos, you have a new Instagram follower as of recent, started following you and trolling your feed. And like you, uh, you've, you've got some really good, like positive things to say and like a lot of mental health, like really encouraging community building posts. I think that like definitely works to your advantage in building that community, just bringing out those good vibes, really like encouraging, supporting other people. That's beautiful, man. I appreciate that. No, you really get back what you give. Like, that's a thing, you know, say, hey, you're dope. You know, love yourself. That shit usually comes back. Like, it's not intentional. Like, I'm not doing it so I get something out of it. It's just, that's the shit I want to see in the world. So, you know, try and put it out there. Yeah. I mean, a lot of artists talk about flow, right? Like, mm -hmm. getting their flow. What does that look like for you? Is there any steps or things you do on the regular to kind of get into your flow as an artist? Like I'll, um, I'll wake up and take a few minutes to kind of level set mentally. Like I'll just sit in my bed. It's like quasi meditating, right? And just fucking be quiet. That's like a big thing. Be quiet. Don't speak. Don't say anything. Like let the world do what the world's doing. I find that when I'm quiet for long enough, I get intent. Like I want to create. Okay, cool. Like I want to go make something now. If I'm like, too busy talking or trying or trying to make something happen. I don't, I don't get motivated in the same way. I find myself like kind of bouncing up against the wall. I would say that's a big part of flow state for me. It's just like allowing things to happen and like being quiet. Like you don't have to be the loudest voice, you know? Yeah. yeah. Find that happy place. <laughs> I feel that. Yeah. But like in the studio, there's not a lot of things that I do. Like, you know, some people have rituals. They're like, I do four push-ups, lay on a four for 15. I don't do any of that stuff. <laughs> Every, it's always different. Um, yeah. But uh, I, I watch cartoons. on. A, I got like a TV that I'm looking up at now. Um, and there's cartoons playing on, uh, on a regular basis uh, or just some kind of cool, wavy, like, you know, cityscape or landscape type of stuff. I burn a lot of incense, you know. Okay. I don't know. Yeah, that's about it. Drink a lot of tea. I've got this oil diffuser over here. I got this stuff called brain aid. It's probably a scam, but when I, <laughs> it's the placebo effect or something, but every time I turn it on, like put my little oil droplets in there and like, it really does keep me awake. So maybe it works. I don't know. You never know. There's a company called Monk. Um, 
they do these like essential oil vaporizers and it's like same vibes this one's called focus and it's supposed to be like a combination of essential oils that have a nootropic effect you know when used together or whatever yeah they did like some kind of case study and showed that like arithmetic arithmetically whatever word that is uh but like arithmetic you know people have like yeah. a bump in cognition and then verbally they have a bump in cognition you know but like what's like a two-point bump in a hundred point scale and then like how do you really measure that consistently right. like i'm like hey, whatever but i try it Shit, whatever i could do to make my brain work better i'm down yeah same yeah there's yeah. only coffee in a day for me to stay awake so before Other- you just start twitching right like right. start having a spaz attack yeah yeah but like you know natural remedies i think taking care of your physical and mental health as a producer is so important and often overlooked absolutely like walking walking is a game changer dude like real that's a big one yeah, yeah that blood flow yeah I, I mean it's dangerous to walk out here because of the geese but when i do i feel <laughs> better yeah yeah so what are what are you working on right now? Like what's what's your next project? I mean, you talked about, you know, getting back into the show thing. Now that the world's coming back to some level of normal, whatever that means. Right. But uh yeah, what projects do you have in the works that you're excited about? There's like three three kind of major initiatives for me at the moment. Technically four, but one of them doesn't exist yet. Uh well two of them kind of don't exist. Anyway, uh Sidechain Society is an online producer community. Um, that that I'm working in on a regular basis. We're about 300 members deep right now. Awesome. Uh, what does that yeah. look like? What, what do the members get? So, yeah. So, maybe you join, it's 20 bucks a month. You get every drum kit ever made for free and every one I will make in the future, you know, as long as you're a member, you get that for free also. Yeah. Um, every week, I kind of like brain dump, you know, there's some kind of like video uh, I'm making at the request of the community. Like, you know, what do y'all want me to make a video on? They're like, hey, you know, is there a difference between how Machine Plus and an NPC sounds? So I'm like, okay, cool. Let's take it. This is literally a video I just did. It's like Machine Plus, NPC, SP. Let's listen. I made the same beat on all three of them and then compared them all to see if there was like sonic differences in between them and then took that and mastered it. And it was like, all right, after mastering, are there sonic differences in between them? And then like, you know, I made a, a, a beat in Ableton the other day that I really, really liked. Like that probably one of the more standout mixes I've had in a while. And I was like, okay, I got to break that down too. So that was another video I did this week. And it was like, I broke that down from top to bottom. Like, hey, I did this with the plugins, this setting for the drums, this setting for the reverb. Here's this sin, that sin. Here's what's on the master bus, the whole thing. Um, oh. Yeah, so once a week they get one of those. And it's from like lighting to composition to to pitches for businesses to like how to write uh, a proper email, like the, everything, literally every part of my business I've broken down on one part or another even like the whole music business side of things you know there's a lot of courses out there as far as just like you know learning music production but you can make the coolest beats in the entire world but if nobody hears them or if you don't have the connections to help me move forward Mm -hmm. depends on what you want to do but you know you can only go so far so right 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 and then it's like what i noticed too like when i'm listening to a mixing course or when i'm listening to a marketing course or when i'm listening to even production stuff it's coming from a perspective that's like adjacent to what I do, but not necessarily the same. I'm listening to Young Guru a ton. He's a icon, yeah. phenomenal engineer, legend. I'm like, all of the salutes to Young Guru. And I know that what he does and what I do are slightly different. Since he's teaching are so valuable to me as a young producer, but at the same time, there are some things that I'm going to do because I don't have a vocal in my mix that he won't. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, or let's say like, um, let's say I'm listening to Gary V and he's talking about building an audience and Gary V is building an audience from the perspective of either selling like some kind of digital product or like providing value to a community. But that community is usually based on somebody who's going to resonate with podcasts or speaking or something of that nature. So like, it's a little bit different from how a producer is going to talk about that. Or like even production, if I'm watching, say like decap talk about drums, or if I'm watching like uh, even watching you talk about Ableton stuff, like, if, you know, that class and the way that you're going to approach that is slightly different than somebody in my unique situation. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, every single voice is absolutely necessary. And at the same time, the inverse of that is like, there's literally space for every single voice. So it's like, cool, I got this weird ass perspective that I'm coming to it from. Here's yeah. what you do if you're an anime nerd and you like these type of beats. 
<laughs> here's all of the random things that I've done to get to the place where I'm at. And if I'm, you know, that stuff I think is valuable. Um, totally. Yeah. It goes yeah, yeah. To finding that community you were talking about earlier, like that place you could connect and really thrive and learn and grow. Mm hmm. Hey, you wanted to take this time real quick to remind you to check out audience interfaces. Um, I mentioned earlier their ID14 MK2 uh, and the ID4. Um, they deliver a lot of really awesome studio recordings with their audience console mic preamps. They have really great converters. If you're in the market for getting a new audio interface, definitely check out Audient. Just go to audient.com, A-U-D-I-E-N-T.com slash A-M-P podcast and look them up. Also, big thanks to Melodics for supporting this episode as well. They make that really cool desktop app. It's a great way to grow your skills, plug in almost any MIDI controller. It's great for finger drumming and playing scales on the push, as well as my MIDI keyboard. I also play drums. They have an electronic drum kit, less in variety, so you can grow your skills that way as well. Check that out. Go to Melodics.com, M-E-L-O-D-I-C-S.com and use the discount code LPO-20 to save 20% or check out the free trial. And back to today's episode. Thanks for listening, everyone. Providing that for people. And there's a lot of niches out there. Like I'm a firm believer that nobody has an excuse not to grow or learn. With all the content, all the communities and memberships and everything that exists in the world today, people don't have an excuse not to do it. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's wild, man. And like, it's really cool to see kind of like the world moving in this way where everything is like hyper connected to where you can literally just be yourself and make a living from it. Like that's a thing. You just do you and you're, you can take care of your family or yourself in some situations, but like you can just do you like, there's not a thing that you have to do or like make believe or make up or put on a face. Like you can literally just whatever it is that you're into do it. <laughs> you could be good. Like Americans. Wow. You want to call it? Yeah. It's real. Yeah. It's, yeah, real. it's beautiful. I, I'm like, I'm an eighties baby. So like I grew up in the nineties and shit. So like I come from this like very analog space and to see like it progressed to digital and then that progressed to like whatever we're doing now. This is past digital. This is some kind of like cyborg mind <laughs> MK ultra thing that we're into at this point. Yeah. But like to see the progression from that to this and then understand how like, like I was a working dude. Like I started my life working construction. Like I was in the military digging trenches. Like literally, that's what I did for a living, climbing poles, digging trenches. Like, and then I got out and worked more of that and then got into contracts and then got really hitty and got into like engineering work and then got out of all of that and I just make music. Yeah. And like, I'm better off now. And that's crazy. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I did all of this stuff I was supposed to do. Yeah. And then I said, eh, whatever, to all of that. And I just make music. And it's not even like popular music. It's just the shit I like. Yeah. I'm, that's crazy to me. That's it's crazy. Story, though. I mean, you even worked for Google at one point, right? Right, right. We did, uh, when I was doing the engineering stuff, I was doing uh, fiber optics engineering and working on a project they had. Yeah. That's cool. And we were working on the Google Fiber project, which. Like, that's, yeah, that's some next level engineering stuff. Um, it, it was, it was crazy. Um, but like a lot of the skills I learned working at that job, because it was like high level project management essentially is what we were doing. Um, we weren't necessarily doing the majority of the engineering work. Some but okay. we managed people that were doing stuff. And then like, you know, we would do some forms of engineering work. You know, we would kind of dive in when necessary, but we were what they call like a subject matter expert. Yeah, I was just going to say, so at what point did you cross that threshold of doing this whole like, nine to five, whatever you want to call it, hustle into being like, you know, I'm just going to start making music and do what I love. Like what helped you jump that ship and make that transition? There was a reoccurring theme in every position I had. Um, I either got fired or laid off. <laughs> Simple yeah. as that. And like, I realized that the way the world works, there's no such thing as a permanent job anymore. Like you don't get a job and you work and then retire and get a pension. That's kind of dead. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's terrible to say that out loud because like, you know, like our entire system is built so people could go to school, go to college, get a job, work the job for X amount of years and then retire yeah. and then have a pension and go live the rest of their life. And I, it's somewhere in there, it kind of clicked like, bro, this is bullshit that doesn't exist anymore. Like the system is broken and the system hasn't realized it's broken yet. 
how does industry actually work now? And it was like, oh, people just do what they like. <laughs> and then there, there's just enough in the world for people to do what they're like and be okay. And it's like a concept that I couldn't wrap my head around at first. Um, but once it kind of clicked, that was it. Um, but yeah, once I got laid off from the, the Google gig, um, I was working with this engineering firm and Google was like, we're out of this business. And um, they let us all off, man. And these, these are like guys, like I was probably one of the more junior cats in the company, but these were guys who make like a quarter million dollars a year salary, but they got laid off. You know what I mean? Some of these dudes had worked there for 20 years plus. Some of them had like kids in private school and three or four different houses and, you know, the whole thing. And it was like, you're laid off and they have to figure it out. And I was like, I'm not doing this shit. I don't want to be them. Like, you know, the, the only person you can be when you're working a job is your boss. Like, it's not like you want to make a new job. You know, that dude that you work for is you in five years or whatever, you know? So I'm looking at them and I'm looking at them freak out because they're getting fired, essentially. And I'm like, I'm not doing that shit. <laughs> it's not it's not the business. I don't want to do that. Yeah. Uh, what else can I do? And I that community thing, man, I had a bunch of friends in Atlanta and they were doing amazing stuff. We were working together on Controller Rise and it was like quasi working. And I noticed the online community was like, kind of doing what it was doing and it was quasi working. And I was like, I'm gonna just try this shit. Like I'm gonna lean into this and see what happens if I just give it like a proper go and like, you know, give the same amount of effort to this that I was giving to this job. What happens if you work for yourself versus working for the company, you know? Yeah. Um, and honestly, like literally everybody in my life that was close to me was like, what are you doing right now? You're an engineer. Why are you, why do you want to, like, you're a civil engineer. Like, you literally hustled your way into a civil engineering position. Like, you're not even supposed to be there. You yeah. found your way into it. You're making six figures a year, and now you want to be a musician. Is this, like, some kind of midlife crisis? Have you watched too many rap videos? Like, what is happening right now? This doesn't make sense. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I hear you, Mom. But <laughs> I'm like... I'm going to be a musician. I don't know what to tell you. And then my wife was like, dude, we just bought the house. We just bought a car. My parents just moved in. Like, what are you doing? Like, <laughs> what is going on right now? And I was like, I hear you, wife, but I'm going to be a musician. This is going to work out. It's going to be great. That's cool. And uh, yeah, it was stressful, but shit, here we are. Like here a big transition for sure. A hell of a transition, dude. Yeah. But you know, my mom's still my mom. My wife is still my wife. Good. Everything's cool. Uh, and we made it through. As long as mom and wife are happy, that's <laughs> then uh, then you're happier, right? Okay. Yeah, you're yeah. pretty much as long as the women in your life are good, then you're good. You're okay, yeah. Because yeah, if they're pissed, you're not happy. You're not happy at all. Right. You're gonna start making some angry music. Right. Yeah. Very very violent. Either that or very peaceful. Veggie tacos. A lot of that series came from that time period because I just needed to like yeah. find some chill. <laughs> Tacos, man. Everybody loves tacos, really. Right. You don't. Right. You're not human. Exactly. Yeah. Well, you released several slappy drum sample packs. Mm -hmm. By the way, I love the artwork for those. One of them is like that Batman slapping Robin. <laughs> yeah. Artwork that you can see, like, yeah, yeah. and uh, oh, I forget what the other ones were. They're pretty hilarious. It's very fitting. What, is a, what does it look like for you creating these sample packs? Maybe we can nerd out a little bit. Like, what's your process for creating and releasing a pack? Yeah, so I actually use Ableton Creating Notes, which is interesting. Um, but yeah, so what I ended up doing was creating like an hour-long track and say this was snare. And I had multiple, you know, sticks, brushes, whatever. And I would just hit this snare in different ways and different, you know, different patterns and different like level of... Uh, dampening on the snare drum i might put a wallet on top tape it put my elbow on it put a pillow whatever whatever i could do to change the sound you know um but i would do that for like an hour and then i would do it for the kick drum and then i would do it for bongos and then for percussion and i would have these big long files and i would just fly them in ableton and then be like okay cool chop it to transients and then i would just go through and hit each transient and record each transient and the way I did it was the output of that track would go through UAD. So I literally had the outputs of my UAD, uh, Apollo, so Apollo sound card, like a pair of outputs would go to a pair of inputs and yeah. I would like have a whole chain of processing there. Um, in some cases I might go through some hardware, like I might go out of, you know, a set of outputs through like an SP or whatever, you know, into the, another thing. Um, Are you saying 
What were some of the plugins used with UAD for processing? I'm curious because I'm a UAD junkie myself. Nice. Um, that VSM distortion plugin, uh, Culture Vulture, right. um, the that. SSL channel because it's super punchy. Um, Voice of God, which is like Yo, the best plugin you, ever. Ever. You put <laughs> that on a bass, man. It's game. That, your speakers will just be like woofing. It'll be like a freaking fan in your place from all That's that. That's it. It's just kind of. Yeah. Young Guru. That was another Young Guru thing. I saw him uh, using it on bass. I had always used it on kick drums, um, but I saw him using it on bass, and I was like, oh, mm. oh, okay, cool. Like, I can do it on bass. But, um, but yeah, so those were big. What else did I use? The SSL bus compressor, a ton. Yeah. I love the character of it. Um, the stressor, the stressor, a ton. I love the character of it. Uh, the Ampex tape, I use that a ton. I use a fat, so it just depends on what sound, you know? Totally. Uh, yeah. But and yeah. you listening who doesn't know maybe what we're talking about a lot, like the cool thing about UAD is they emulate real gear in real life. So these are all like real pieces of hardware that have existed over the studios for many years. So, which is really cool. You can learn the software, you can walk into a studio, some fancy ass studio, and you can know how to use all the hardware that's been around for forever. Right, right. And that happened. Like I, I go to the studio, I'm like, hey man, give me a... You know, like let's do the, let's do the bus compressor on this. Yeah. And they're like, what? I'm like, yeah, let's put the bus compressor on these drums. And they're like, okay. <laughs> like, what are you doing that for? And then you know, they're like, oh shit, okay, you know, let's start. Okay, okay, I like that. You know. Yeah. And they're like, same thing with uh, what is it, the stressor? Like, you just get all of this real world, quote unquote, kind of experience. So you can go talk your shit now in the studio, and they look at you like you know what you're talking about, which is awesome. Shout out to you, hey, dude. Yeah. Shout out. That's cool, man. That's really dope. Um, so you basically just chop the transients. You get one long take on different individual instruments, mm -hmm. and uh, just basically export that out, and then just one by one, and then upload that. And you're you're selling these through your site. Is there anywhere else that you've sell, sold them? Or the first one I did, I put on Splice. Um, it actually debuted at like number nine, which is amazing. Um, and congrats! Thank That's you. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I don't even know how to happen, but it was it was there for a while. Um, and it was just like some drums. It's not like a bunch of samples. I'm not like, you know, I don't have any Grammys or no shit like that. I'm not playing a bunch of crazy shit. It's literally just one shots from drums. That's it. Yeah. And um, yeah, it came out, did really well. Um, but yeah, that was the only one that really was sold anywhere else. Um, I did a collaboration with Serato. And where we had took a bunch of them and put them inside of Serato Studio, which was amazing. It was really cool. Um, I'm trying to think of anybody else. Uh, Melodics, we did some stuff with. I did a pack with um, Soul Surplus. Melodics is doing, they're sponsoring this podcast, actually. Oh, yeah. Shout out to Melodics, man. That's awesome. Great company, man, for sure. Yeah, they're really dope. Um, but yeah, I, you know, did some stuff with them. Um, so surplus, we did a, a pack for Dilla for free. That was amazing. Um, but outside of that, it's been pretty much just on Jay the site. Yeah. Pack for Jay Dilla. That's that's really sick, man. I didn't really. Yeah, yeah he's yeah. a total legend for sure. Changed the game. Yeah, yeah. Dilla, Dilla changed my life. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I yeah. mean, I'm, I'm from Detroit. Like, you know, I was born in Detroit. So, like, I have a, you know, kind of soft spot for anything from there already. But like even without that, like you know, I think that dude, his music would have impacted me. I was a big on Slum Village and all of that, you know what I'm saying. So like, I was so into that sound as it was. But then I heard like, fucking, like that time period where Donuts came out, and then like uh, J Love Japan, like that shit, like the uh, the J Lib project, that is like a certain tone in there that yeah. like stuck with me, and like. I'm, I'm, I'm completely honest. Like, I don't have any shame. Like, I've been trying to recreate that tone. And in trying to recreate it, I found my own little thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that became kind of like my signature sound or whatever. But like, yeah, man, that, that dude legit changed my life. Like, So cool, man. Yeah. I'd be pulling from inspirations of other people. This is so important, I think, for artists, you know? It is. It is. And for me, like, even just checking out Spotify Discover Weekly. I'm hearing stuff I've never heard before, new genres I've never discovered before, like constantly having that hunger to like seek out like new ways and little pieces and bits that I stumble upon that inspire me. It doesn't even have to be, you know, but, but totally, man. 
So uh, let's go back into like maybe some of inside the box things with Ableton. As far as just Ableton stuff, I mean, this is the Ableton podcast, I guess we could talk about Ableton. Absolutely. <laughs> like as far as like devices and instruments, do you have any like go-to favorites you always go to as far as producing in, in live? Man, you know what I, I use? Like literally almost every mix is that damn LFO plugin. I'm all over that thing. Yeah. Um, I just throw it on random shit and move things around. Yeah, that's a pretty constant thing. Um, yeah, and that's bundled into Live 11 now. Um, mm-hmm. It's like its own device. It was Max for Live, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that shit is, all, I love that thing. Um, auto filters all the time. Just I like that wah wah thing. That shit is cool for the bounce. Everybody uh, likes little wobbles. Yeah. Yeah, that's important. Um, what else? The glue compressor I use like exclusively for side chaining shit. Uh, I just love the way it side chains, like in comparison to other compressors uh, within the within within live even. Like it's just I like it for side chaining. It's the thing to do it with. Um, what else am I into? Uh, the probability art. Ooh, that thing is fire. Records. Yeah. Yes, it is. Yeah, man. And it like it goes the whole way up to like elevens. So like that's really fire. You could do like major, minor elevens and move shit around. That's awesome. Yeah. That was part of the probability pack, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Like two years ago or something. Yeah. yeah. I was like, I stumbled onto that thing with that shit. Oh, that's shit. That thing's amazing. Um what else? Drum racks, obviously, simpler, obviously. Sure. Um the that damn drum bus is fire. I like that a lot. Yes. It's thick. I put that on like pianos too, not even mm. drums. It just makes it just makes it sound thick. That's crazy. Okay. Okay. Uh okay. All right. Never thought of that. Um Yeah. Operator, fire for basses. Operator's a mean ass sense. People sleep. Um, um echo much. That's my my number one. It's just, what's that? Is echo with a echo? five ten. Yeah, that's the delay. So it's a the rolling space echo. Basically, Ableton made their own version. Ah, uh, see, I haven't even dove into that thing much. Yeah, man. Yeah, if you get inside of the, uh, you go into the modulation tab. Yeah, yeah. You get real weird with that, and uh, play with some of that feedback. And then at the bottom, most people miss it, but at the bottom of the middle of the device, there's a little arrow. You can open up a filter window, so you can clean up some of the low end in that as well with the delay. Mm, yeah, and- I'm with. A- Big fan of the space echo too, so that's I need that in my life, and I can automate it. Oh yeah, that's going down. It's going to happen. Appreciate that. Yeah, for sure, man. That's why I yeah. do from you. We all learn. Hell yeah, Galaxy Echo. I was using it for UAD to do the same thing, but like to be able to do it in um, in Ableton with like no latency is a game changer. Because yeah, I'll stack a bunch of Galaxy Echoes up and shit, oh. and I get hella latency after a while. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's dope. Good thing. Um, I said there's so many toys. Like Man, it's uh, crazy. It's crazy, man. Um I'm trying to think of what else I was using. Probably are we talked about that. LFO, the filters. Dude. Which version of live are you on right now? Eleven. Okay. Yeah. 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 I've been falling in love with Redux lately. Redux is fire. Yeah, the new Redux that they redid is really dope. You can dry wet mix it and you can do like a pre or post filter and then I like to automate it. Like if anybody wants some like really weird ass lasery sounds, like I love automating that uh, frequency knob. You get some mm-hmm. stuff. Yeah, that's another thing that you could do with them LFOs too. You just stick an LFO on it and just let it rock out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. totally. And you you know mess around with phase and kind of get it to bounce like you want to. And it's like it's a freaking wormhole, man. Like you can't, you know, it's yeah. endless. Damn, I had another one on my top like. Right at the top of my head, I can't. I can't think of it now. That's cool. We'll come back to you maybe another time. Maybe yeah. on the podcast again in the future. And you'll be like, "Hey, I remember that one thing I was going to say." Yeah, that'd be awesome. Um, yeah, I'll remember it eventually. <laughs> it's all good, man. Yeah. Uh, dude, I uh, I want to respect your time. I know we've been chilling for an hour, and uh, like, thank you so much for joining the podcast. It was really cool hanging with you. Likewise. Where's the best place for people to stay connected with you and anything else you want to share? I'm on IG a ton. That's probably like where I'm most active on social media. So if you want to get at me there, that's cool. But realistically, like, you know, just search Stolen Drums on the internet and I'll pop up. StolenDrums.com is my website, so you can get all my stuff there. And, uh, you know, wherever you listen to music or wherever you vibe at, I'm on Twitch regularly. I'm on YouTube regularly doing live streams and stuff. I'm I'm out here in the world, man. Just Look for beats, you'll find me. 
Yeah, yeah, for sure. And as always, everybody listening, I'm going to include links, stolen drums in the show notes. So make sure you follow him on YouTube, Instagram, all the places. Uh, go check out his website. Maybe download the slappy drums. Uh, definitely would be curious to check that out myself. I, I love the samples and the sounds that you're using in your productions. Uh, you're definitely like one of the, the big players in the game and appreciate you and all you're doing for the community. So That's some, what's up, man. You got a good heart. Keep doing what you're doing, man. We appreciate you. And yeah, looking forward to seeing future projects, maybe some more veggie tacos. Yeah, it's on the way. It's on the way. Hey, I'll do the sign off everywhere I'm at, anywhere. Uh, so it, it goes uh, three things. Number one, life is good. Two, time is precious. Three, make somebody smile because that shit is tight. Uh, drink water, eat fruit, stay blessed, pay it forward. You know, yeah, that stuff. That's good, man. It's good stuff. Yeah, man. Love That's it. the mantra. That's the mantra, man. Good stuff. Oh, yeah. That goose sample pack soon. Maybe you can make something of it too. I'll make some shit. I'll make some fire shit with the goose sounds for sure. I got you. I look for <laughs> Cool. The man. jazz interpretation of a fleet. Of, what is it called a fleet? What the fuck? What do you call a group of geese? Herd of geese. <laughs> is it a herd? Is that what it is? I don't know, man. A flock. Uh, it would be a flock, wouldn't it? I don't know. I keep thinking fleet. I don't know why. I, it's like it could be a fleet. When I think of fleet, I think of like a military fleet, which would be. Yeah. It, it it actually makes sense because they really are like dangerous, like birds. They'll like attack you and the herd. They're flying formation and shit, like. Do man. So yeah, it's they're basically yeah. like you know angry cobra chickens who can fly. It's kind of what. It, I don't know, man. I, I it might be a fleet. I'm gonna look it up, but uh. If think, it is, I win, I guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I'm going to go with flock, but uh, okay. we'll find it. I'll do some Googling and then I'll get at you and probably post up on your Instagram and be like, yo, here's that goose sample pack. It's, it's a fleet or flock. We'll figure it okay. out. I sent you this flock of sounds. All right, bet. All right, <laughs> All right bro. <laughs> cool. It's good hanging with you, man. Uh, Likewise. Be- and I'll, I'll see you soon. All right, man. Peace. Later. Yo, thanks everybody for checking out the podcast. Quick reminder, if you want to grab my free Ableton Live 11 shortcuts, go to liveproducersonline.com slash live 11 shortcuts and download it for free. Also, you will be subscribed to the newsletter, so you'll receive emails and be the first to know when new podcast episodes come out and other cool stuff. Also, if you want to purchase Ableton Live 11, I'd be glad to hook you up with a discount. Just go to liveproducersonline.com slash buy Ableton, and I will see you guys next time.